Hi everyone, I'm Jane and today we are going to paint this sunset celestial space-ish type triptych. You guys have been asking me for triptych videos for quite a while now, so I figured it was time to do that for you. You can certainly do this painting on a single canvas if that's what you like, or you could do it on canvases of any size or shape that you like. Also, please don't worry about having the exact same colors as I'm using. Use whatever colors you have and whatever colors you like to get the feeling that you're going for. With that said, if you'd like to know the exact materials that I'm using for this video, check out the video description below for a full list. If you haven't already, make sure you hit that subscribe button so that you can paint with me every week. Now let's get started. Today, as you can tell, I'm using three Frederick's Red Label canvases in the 12 by 16. So essentially what I have here is a canvas 16 inches wide by 36 inches tall. So we are going to create a triptych. Now I have my canvases just kind of pinched in my easel here and it's fairly steady. I'll have to watch it a little bit. If you don't have an easel that will hold canvases like this or you're not comfortable with that, feel free to lay them out on a table, on the floor, whatever, and paint them like that. And what I'm gonna do first is create an underpainting for my sky. I'm not gonna start just making the clouds because then I might have to contend with some of the white of the canvas showing. So I'm gonna underpaint it first. So I've got all of my colors that I'm gonna use here in order of how I'm going to use them. And I'm gonna start on my lowest canvas here. I'm gonna use my one inch flat brush for this. I'm gonna wet it in my jar. And wipe it off pretty good on the edge. Now at the very bottom here, just right at the very edge, I wanna have just a little bit of blue. So I have cobalt blue. You can use any blue you like for a sky. I like cobalt blue. So I'm gonna grab just a little bit of cobalt and some white. Get a nice pale color. I also have a little matte medium that I may or may not use. I'm really gonna be using the edge of my brush or the, the tip of it, sorry, and kind of scratching my colors in. You don't have to worry too much about having this be exactly the way you want it just now because we are gonna come back after it dries and put clouds over top of it. So anything you don't like, you can take away then. We'll just put a little hint of it up in here. And let it just kind of dissipate and fade out as we move up. I don't want a lot of that blue in here. But if I, if I put in less, if I put in as much as I think I want, then I'm gonna lose a lot of it and I'll have less than I actually want. So I'm gonna put in more than I actually want because I will end up covering some of it. All right. All right, I cleaned off my brush and now I'm gonna get some Cad Yellow. This color is quite powerful and I wanna save the really powerful bits of it for later when we're doing the clouds. So I dunked into my white, a good amount of white, and I'm really gonna lighten that color. Same thing, just the tip of my brush. I'm not gonna try and blend into the blue. Obviously I'll get green if I do. Just picked up more white. If your blue is still quite wet and you're worried about getting green, just let it dry before you come back and, and do this part. I'm using super light pressure where I'm going over the blue. My blue is still quite wet. I may let this dry before I finish. I just hit it with my blow dryer real quick. Much better. See, just scratching over it. Overlapping the blue sometimes, sometimes not. Just really long horizontal brush strokes.
then I'm going to start doing the same thing with the yellow, kind of taking it up and letting it dissipate, just kind of disappear. And notice there, I kind of started arcing my brush strokes. So it went from horizontal to just having a little bit of an arc. As I move up, those brush strokes are going to get much more arced like that to give us a, a feeling of a really expansive sky. One thing that's important when doing a triptych or any kind of a set of paintings of a single image like this is to make sure that you don't treat each canvas as an individual. So what I mean is I have my color kind of arcing here and it stops at that corner. So instead, I'm gonna take it up above. Hopefully you can see that, you'll see in a minute. I took it up into that next canvas. Now these two canvases are connected. I have not cleaned off my brush. I'm gonna get some more white, maybe a little matte medium because it's getting kind of dry, and pull some quinacridone in. Same brush stroke. Just starting with the tip of my brush, scratching it over. It's okay if it blends with the yellow. Just a little matte medium. There we go. And again, right over top of that other canvas. Just as much as you can, pretend like that split where the canvases meet doesn't even exist. Down in here, just kind of scratching it into that yellow, covering up some of it, letting it blend with some of it. Really light pressure, not I'm not crushing my brush down into this. And I'm using very little paint, which helps me get a really nice soft blend. Put a little more pressure when I need some extra paint. All of those white spots I left in here before, I'm gonna go back and fill in with this pink. interesting little point. I think I even want to get just a little bit more for this bottom area. Not too strong. Let's keep moving up with that quinacridone in white. So like I said, we are going to put clouds over this or, you know, kind of, kind of suggest clouds. So if there's something in here you don't like, don't worry about it right now. Don't try to correct it. Just put clouds over it later. Leave a little bit of a white spot there. Maybe I'll bring some of the next color down into there. And let's continue. Continue on up. I'm really going to start arcing that sky there. Nice and high. Meet it up there. Maybe I'll grab a little more white. See how I bring that white down into the previous canvas. Again, it just ensures that they appear to be connected. And let's start dissipating this, this pink. I 
maybe just a little bit more white. And now I'm gonna clean my brush off because I don't want the yellow in here to mix with the next color. All right, clean brush, and I'm gonna get some deep violet, some matte medium, and just a little bit of white. Really fill that in. I really love watching the whole feel of the painting change based on, you know, what colors are where, how those colors mix with each other. I mean, that part alone is, <laughs> is one of my favorite parts of painting like this. And we start to get a feeling of, you know, a real expansive sky. That spot there that I left blank, we're gonna throw some of that purple in there because that'll be a nice contrast and kind of unexpected next to that yellow. And that yellow is dry, so it won't blend and give us a muddy color. Just overlap and create some, a little bit of drama. A little bit of matte medium to just thin out that purple and really layer it over that yellow. And if it's muddy, if it gets away from you, either throw some white over it, or like I said, don't worry about it. Come back later and just put a cloud over it. Okay, let's keep going there, matte medium. And my deep violet, I didn't pick up any white, there might still be some on my brush. But we're starting to get up to where it's gonna look like night. So I want to make these colors start appearing a little bit darker, mixing a little less white in there. Let's really darken up this area here. All right, now I'm gonna move into my Diox purple. I has, still have not cleaned off this brush. A little matte medium, just a tiny bit of white, not a lot. And let's get this color in here, up into that canvas. You can get the tip of the brush in there if you want to make sure that you get that canvas covered in the middle. I'm not worried about getting these colors you know, solidly into the edges there, you know, wrapping the image because I never do that. <laughs> it's just way too much work for me. So when I'm done, what I'll do is just paint the edges black. Nice and dark in there. And over here, blend it in with that previous purple. Get a little hint of it in here. Actually gonna grab a little quinacridone throw that in there too 
I'm not trying to blend these perfectly. I'm just, you know, trying to streak them together. A little more diox, and then we're about to move on to our final colors. Let's get this side up nice and high. And then fade it out. Sorry, I know my easel is super wobbly. I have to keep putting my foot on the bottom of it to keep it from running away. You just get some of that up in here. Most of that's not gonna show but some of it might. And on to our next color. This is Payne's Gray. I'm not gonna use any white in here for right now. Now with all of these colors that I'm using, if you don't have any of them, please don't sweat that. You know, sunsets, they come in so many colors. Use what colors you have that you like. You know, don't, don't worry about trying to, you know, make the color that I have if you don't have it. Just use what you like. You don't have to have these exact colors. Still just paints and matte medium. No white. Matte medium here. I would say it's completely optional. You don't have to use matte medium. Again, it's something that I like to do because I love to blend with it. It's my favorite way to blend. It just helps me get a nice smooth transition and it keeps the paint wet a little bit longer than just water alone. Let's get just a hint of that Payne's Gray, kind of down here. Because I had some white spots there, so I might as well take advantage of it. One more little batch of Payne's Gray right here. And black, this is Mars Black. And I'm gonna fill in the rest of this area all with black. I know that if you've never used Payne's Gray, you probably feel like there's not going to be a lot of difference between the Payne's Gray and the Mars Black, but there really is. Payne's Gray is so much softer and it's a little bit bluer than Mars Black. Mars Black tends to be kind of warm. And it's a much, it's a much bolder color than Payne's Gray. So even right here where it meets up with that Payne's Gray, doing the exact same thing, just kind of sliding them together with the tip of the brush. But if you don't have Payne's Gray, just use Mars Black. I use Payne's Gray a lot though, so I do highly recommend you get some Payne's Gray. It's such a useful color. It's such a wonderful color to use. And I think the first time you use it, you'll see the value in it. All right, let's just throw a hint of this black down in here. And now I'm gonna make some stars up in the dark area. Use whatever method you prefer for stars. I am gonna use my half inch flat brush. I'm gonna wet it in my jar. And then I'm just gonna bring it out and just kind of shake off the extra drip. I've got my white paint and I'm gonna pull a little bit of it out and start mixing that water that's in my brush. 
and with the white paint. I don't want it completely flowing all over the place. I just want a nice thin mixture. You could also use uh, fluid paints if you have them, like soft body paints. There we go. See that paint's not flowing around, but it's much thinner than it was. I'm gonna pick up quite a bit. And I'm gonna hold it so the corner is facing the canvas and I'm just gonna flick across the top. It's very similar to the look that you get if you use a toothbrush. So if you use a toothbrush, that's fine. Some of my stars are big, some of them are quite small. And some are actually getting on the, the other colors below, but that's okay because I'm gonna put clouds over them. That's why I'm doing this now instead of at the end. Lots and lots of stars all in the dark area. Not worried about the lighter areas. So many stars. Inevitably, whenever we do stars, somebody says, oh, I got too carried away with the stars. I have too many stars. You can never have too many stars. Just go crazy with them. If you get one that gets away from you, just kind of tap like that. Oh, especially since the paint is still wet and it'll be gone. There we go. All right, there's the beginning of our sky. At this point, if there's something you don't like, like I kind of feel like I have way too much of this blue yellow going on at the bottom, you could come back and, you know, do the same thing and kind of touch it up and take the colors away or add them wherever you feel like you need them. I think I'm going to, I can't decide. I might come back in a minute and just kind of bring some of this down a little bit lower. I really just wanted a suggestion of these colors at the very bottom, but I'm going to let it dry for a few minutes, take a break from it, not look at it, and then I'll come back and decide. Okay, as I was taking a break and looking at this, I decided I am going to bring some of these colors down just a little bit lower. I kind of like what I have going on right in this area here, so I'm going to bring that down a bit and just kind of simplify the bottom here. So that'll just take me a couple of minutes. So I'm going to be using the same brush, same colors, same techniques. So if I kind of get lost in my own little world, you know what's going on here. I think I'm going to pull just a hint of yellow in there. I like that really warm orangey color I get with the yellow and the quinacridone. See, at any time you can change anything, anything at all.
looking much better, much closer to what I wanted. Just get a hint of that purple back in here and then we can move on. Okay, now that I have the underpainting done and my stars are mostly dry, I'm gonna go ahead and place my moon. Now I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the moon. It's gonna be pretty simple. And I'm just gonna take something that I like the size of and use that to trace my moon. So I have this roll of tape. Whatever you have is perfectly fine. I'm gonna decide where I want my moon to be. Kinda right there. I have my white chalk pencil, but as always, you can use whatever it is you like to draw on canvas with, whether it's watercolor pencil or sidewalk chalk, whatever. I'm just gonna trace that shape on there. Now I'm gonna take my half inch angle brush and I did wet it in my jar. And I'm just gonna dunk into some white paint and start filling it in. When I get to the edges, I'm gonna change my brush stroke and be a little bit more cautious but right now I'm just kind of spreading that paint around a bit for the for the edge of the moon rather than trying to go around like this because I'll lose control of the tip of my brush and it gives me a fuzzy line see that so what I'm gonna do is use the chisel edge of my brush and I can cut just the sharpest most accurate line possible Do that all the way around. I tend to hold my breath <laughs> when making straight lines like that. Just worry about filling in all of the little spots right now. And making a straight edge, obviously. What I mean is don't worry about getting an even coverage. I know that you can see some of the, some of the white looks a little more transparent than other parts and that's okay. That will actually help me get the look that I'm going for in a little bit, so I'm not gonna worry about that. Now I'm gonna get just a little bit more white, not a ton of paint, and my Payne's Gray, I'm gonna come in and just kinda pick up a little blop of Payne's Gray. Payne's Gray is quite a soft color, so it's not gonna overtake this like black would if I picked up that much black. I'm just gonna kinda plop it down somewhere, and then just kinda using the tip of my brush, kinda squidge it out a little. I'm using light pressure, so it looks like I'm scrubbing, but I'm barely touching, see that? I'm gonna leave some areas quite heavy with this Payne's Gray and some areas I'm gonna let it really fuzz out and be quite soft. Put a little more there. In some places get it right up to the edge of your moon otherwise if you stop and you've got like this white ring around everything inside it's gonna look awkward. Just throw a little bit of what's left over here. If you get too much dark, don't worry about it. Let it dry, come back and change it later. I can even come in and pick some of that up and move it somewhere else.
Okay, I am happy with that moon, so let's go ahead and start working on our clouds. So for my clouds, I'm gonna start up in this darker area and I'm gonna use my number 12 cloud brush. If you don't have my cloud brushes, use whatever brush you have that you're comfortable doing a little bit of scrubbing with. My brushes were certainly made for this technique, but it doesn't mean that it's the only brush that you can use for this technique. So I'm gonna start with my Payne's Gray. I'm gonna get just a bit of it. I'm not loading up with a ton of paint here. Can you see? There's no blobs of paint. I'm gonna come in and get just a little poke of white. I don't wanna lighten up too much in this area. I'm gonna go about half foot pressure. So remember that you're standing flat on the ground, but your weight is rocked toward your toes just a little. Your heel is up off the ground. That's kind of the pressure I'm using here. Just kind of start scrubbing it in there. Don't, don't get hung up too much on making exact clouds. We're really just kind of fogging these colors together. Sometimes the color I pick up is gonna be lighter, sometimes darker. So when you do that kind of twirly motion, you get a really soft blur in the colors. I picked up just a little bit more white that time. So I'm gonna be here closer to the moon. So we'll give it a little bit more of a highlight. That's flat foot pressure, just kind of scraping back and forth. It helps haze out the bottom here without giving it a definite, a definite line. See how it's covering up all those little stars that we didn't want. I'm not gonna worry myself about getting the any light areas as light as I want them because we're gonna come back. After we do the whole canvas, we're gonna come back with the number six cloud brush and do a little bit there too. A little bit of highlighting. I'm just taking a bit of this lighter color out into a couple of places throughout here. So I don't want it to seem like our clouds just stop. Now, if you pick up too much paint with this technique, you're gonna have a really hard time spreading it around. So pick up less paint than you think you need. You see how much white I picked up there? Tiny bit, and I think that might be a little more than I actually want, but we'll see. If I spread it really smoothly and softly, I can probably take it out farther. Yeah, that wasn't too bad. And I typically don't use matte medium, and this brush is dry. I typically don't use matte medium or water when I do this, this kind of technique, but I may use some matte medium today. I'm gonna go, let's see, right in here. Kind of covering that purple a little bit. Maybe I'll leave some of it showing. Throw just a hint more white in there. Lightly blend it out. There we go. And another thing I'm gonna start doing is picking up the next color below. So I picked up a little point of the Diox Purple with that. Let's start throwing it in over here. That didn't show up too much, so I'm gonna pick up a little bit more diox and a little bit more white. There we go. Now we're gonna start to see, you know, kind of the glow from the, the previous colors. I just picked up a tiny bit of Payne's Gray, about the same amount of diox, and a little bit of white. Let 
little Diox, tiny bit, and a bit of white. And don't be afraid, take your clouds over each other. The more you layer these colors together, the more dynamic your sky is gonna seem. See, I took a little bit of that purple into there. Tiny bit of white. And just keep going. Pretty much just picking up diox at this point. I might keep just the tiniest bit of panes in there. And white. See, right over that edge, pretending like that split where the canvases meet doesn't even exist. just want a really slow transition with these colors you know if you if you transition them too quickly or too too harshly you know if you if you don't kind of mix those colors together a little you don't layer them like here then you might have stripes you'll have like Payne's gray stripe of diox, <laughs> stripe of deep violet, you know, and we don't want stripes. That's not what we're looking for. Right here is quite dark. Remember I put more Payne's gray in there. So I'm going to go back into my Payne's gray. I still have that diox on there. Just a tiny bit of white because I still want this area to be nice and dark. I'm actually going to pick up a little point of matte medium. Just a tiny bit. If you're going to use matte medium here, don't use it a lot. If you use a lot, then it really kind of makes the paint smear. And I feel like it makes it harder to get the colors to work together if it smears too much. So I'm using the paint's gray to just, or I'm sorry, the matte medium to kind of thin things down a little bit more. A little bit of white, a little bit of diox purple. Okay, more diox. A little bit more white. I'm starting to move down into the area where it's a bit brighter so I can pick up a little bit more diox. Take it up over that canvas edge. If you nudge up onto the tippy toe like that, that helps you kind of break up lines without, you know, spreading too much paint around. I guess one day I should make you a video of like all the different positions with this brush then and what they do, you know? So we'll kind of talk about that a little bit today. So we talked about half foot pressure. It helps kind of lay down the paint and build the shape that you want initially. Flat foot pressure is going to kind of scrub out the bottom so we have a soft edge at the bottom. Up on the tippy toe, it helps you break up lines. It helps you blend. You want to use soft pressure there. Just helps you get a nice, smooth kind of smokiness to it. And that, the little twirling motion, that really helps to blend digs down into the texture and gives you a super soft, smoky look. Back into my diox, a little bit of white, and I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna grab maybe just a tiny corner of quinacridone.
just remember as you go down you want to start bringing in the colors beneath and here in the diox I'm probably going to do a little bit of both quinacridone and deep violet just a little bit of white maybe I'll grab a little bit of deep violet this time right up over that edge just a little bit of diox and I'm going to grab a good amount of deep violet medium just help me kind of smooth out that line that I had there now I'm letting the underpainting colors kind of guide my decision making you know as I see that I'm starting to get down into the lighter colors I start transitioning into them but that doesn't mean that I'm necessarily saying oh I can only put quinacridone on this part here because that that line is a quinacridone color so that's what color I have to put there I'm not doing that at all I'm just kind of being guided I see that I'm starting to move toward quinacridone so I can start picking some quinacridone up I still have the diox and Payne's gray and everything I'm just gonna get deep violet and some white And I see that again, I left a very dark spot here. So I'm actually gonna go back into my Payne's Gray, just a little bit of Payne's Gray, just a little bit of white. All of those other colors are still in there, so it's not gonna be a, a real solid Payne's Gray color. tippy toe to break that up very light pressure barely touching the canvas back into my deep violet and I'm gonna get a little quinacridone and a little bit more white than I have been half foot pressure lay down that paint and define the shape tippy toe pressure to blend and break up so the matte medium here is just kind of helping me get rid of a little bit of texture when I need it so I'm just picking up little corners you probably can't tell from there but I have a little bit of the canvas texture so I'm just smoothing over it and it kind of helps pull a little bit of extra paint off of my brush and lay it down as well. A little more of both and some white. mostly quinacridone still have all those other colors Let's 
see how we're just kind of giving the suggestion of clouds. Let's grab a little more deep violet, maybe just a hint of diox. Just so we don't have too sudden of a transition there. Here we go. nudge that out and then I'll add some more white. See how that tippy toe pressure gives me that nice cloudy look. That might have been too much white. No, that's not too bad. Tippy toe pressure. There we go. Now I'm getting down into the area where I'm gonna to have to start thinking about cleaning off my brush because I don't wanna use the yellow and the purples on my brush at the same time. Just picked up quinacridone and white there. Tippy toe. Still some quinacridone and deep violet, some white. I'm going to finish up over here. I have a lot of both of those colors right here. Just quinacridone and some white. Let's start transitioning so that we can easily get into that yellow. And so I'm doing that by not picking up purple now. There's still purple on my brush though, so I'm still getting hints of it, just not picking up anymore. Really, right here, I'm all, all I'm picking up is white. All right, I cleaned off my brush and typically I would just get a dry brush for this next part, but I'm not going to. I'm just gonna squeeze the water out with a paper towel as well as I can. Just make sure it's as dry as possible. Sometimes I'll kind of roll it like that. And we're ready for the next part. So we're gonna start out by getting a bit of quinacridone on our brush. I'm not picking up a ton. I'm really just kind of working it into the bristles. And I'll just pick up a little bit more, the tiniest, tiniest amount of that cad yellow and some white. And we'll start over here where we have a good amount of that yellow already. So half foot pressure, lay it down. Get into there if you need to. Pick up just a tiny bit more yellow. Can you see how much yellow I'm using? It's really just a pinpoint. That yellow is very strong. 
I don't want to get, you know, suddenly orange. I want to slowly work into it. See how that just warmed up that quinacridone just a little bit from what it was above. A little bit of white. We're just slowly warming up our quinacridone. Tiny, tiny poke of yellow and some white. There we go. Let it overlap those canvases. Tiny bit of quinacridone, about the same amount of yellow and some white. Now, if we hadn't done that underpainting, I know it kind of seems, it may seem kind of silly to some of you that we did all that work with the underpainting and now we're painting over it. But if I hadn't done that, then I would have to worry with about all of that white canvas showing through. And it actually, and it also works as a guide, you know, so I know what color I want to put where. But then, like I said, I don't have to worry about, that was way too much yellow. I don't have to worry about covering all of the canvas and not letting any of the white of the canvas show because there are areas in here where I did not cover the underpainting at all. You can still see it clearly. A little bit of white, let's pop that. I think this is where the sun, or the sky starts to get really dynamic, is in this transition from the, the cool violets into the warmer colors. Let's keep going with that. We can actually pick up a little more yellow now. Still not a ton of yellow, but it's a little bit more. And some white. I do wanna remember that I still have some of that purple in here, so I am gonna to wanna to come back and do a bit of that, but I might hold off and do that with my number six. I don't know, we'll see. I'm gonna keep a little bit of extra white in the yellow so it doesn't seem too hot and sour. I want it to be very warm and glowing, but not hot and sour. So I'm not gonna use, you know, solid cad yellow. That's gonna be way too bright. Just a little bit more white than yellow. And let's put it right here. See, I didn't cover all of that purple. You can still see it. this part. There we go. More yellow and a good amount of white. the way it's layering over that purple. I may not have to come back and add much, if any, purple. So just to break up that canvas texture, a little point of matte medium. There we go. See how I just kind of layered that over top of the red and everything? Uh, 
Let's put that over here. Just white. Let's grab a little bit more quinacridone. There, just nudge it over that yellow. Gives us that really beautiful layered effect. I think I'm going to keep with that down this side. Just a hint of yellow, mostly quinacridone and white, because I have a lot of that purple in here. So I'm going to kind of let some of that purple show, and I think it looks nice with the quinacridone over top of it. Kind of agrees with the shadows. really enjoying this sky. I feel like I could paint this sky for hours and hours and hours. I won't, but I could. <laughs> I love watching how, you know, each color affects the one above it and the one below it and how it helps things change a little bit and it's really a satisfying process. And, you know, like I said, don't worry about trying to make clouds specifically. Just worry about putting colors in places that is very pleasing to you. And enjoying the way the different, the different brush strokes change the paint, you know, how, like I said, the, the flat foot pressure kind of smokes out the bottom edge while the tiptoe just kind of breaks up that edge and, and kind of smokes the color out a little. Experiment with the different pressures, no matter what brush you're using, and see what effects you get and what you like and maybe what you don't like. Okay, I am actually gonna move I don't have a lot of yellow on here, otherwise I would clean it. I am gonna grab a tiny bit of my deep violet. It's just a tiny bit and some white because look here under the pink, I've got some of that deep violet on both sides and I wanna take advantage of that and just have it look like a little bit of a shadow. Just a little hint of a shadow under there. Nudge that out. I like that a lot. I'm going to keep adding it. There we go. Nice and dark there. Flat foot pressure to smoke out that bottom edge. And same thing on this one. Take advantage of those little bits of inspiration where you see them. I certainly hadn't planned on doing that. But I noticed it was there and thought that would look nice. And you know what? If it doesn't, that's okay too. Because I can just come back and put something over it later. A little point of matte medium. Get rid of some of that texture I just put in there. I do have a little bit of it also 
I'm gonna get some quinacridone with it. Right here, a little bit more white. Just quinacridone and white. You know what, I don't have a ton of that purple on here either, so I'm just gonna go straight into my yellow. Nudge it over that purple. It's just a fiery bright cloud that's kind of in front of it. We are almost done here. A little more yellow, a little more white. As soon as we're done with this part, we're gonna let it dry. I do wanna come back with my number six and just kinda lighten up a couple areas in my highlights and you know maybe play with the nuance of color here and there. but we won't spend quite as much time with the number six as we have with this number 12. We'll just kind of play for a minute and then we'll move on. I wanna to move to my number six because then I can just, you know, kind of drill into little areas better than I can with my number 12. A white little matte medium. Kind of smoke out this area here at the bottom. Okay. Okay, there's our sky so far. And now I'm gonna take my number six cloud brush and just kind of work on popping some of the highlighted areas, maybe introducing a couple of colors into different parts of the clouds that they don't already exist in right now. All right, we're gonna start up here and my brush is dry. I'm gonna get just a little bit of Payne's Gray, just so that I have some on my brush, not, not to lay down a bunch of Payne's Gray. See how I wiped a lot of that off? I'm gonna come in and get some white. Let's pop that area nicely. The same rules apply with this brush. You know, the, the same pressures are going to do the same thing as with the larger brush. Nudge with the tip of the brush. Soften that shape. That's a little aggressive at the bottom there. I'm just going to get some of that lighter color off. And maybe just a tiny poke of some fresh Payne's Gray. Nudge it up there. There we go. I'm going to even come in and get just the tiniest hint of some Diox on there. See, not very much. And my white. Just a little bit of matte medium there. Very nice. Yeah, historically I've not used matte medium 
with this brush, with this technique. But I kind of just started doing that almost randomly when I was, you know, working out some ideas for this painting. And I was like, oh, I kind of like that. So I might do that here and there from now on. Let's see. I don't think it'll be right for every technique, for every painting that I'm doing, but occasionally I might like to see a little bit of that in there. Just working on a little bit more of that purple. From that media, maybe the tiniest bit of Payne's Gray. Smooth out that bottom part. Little diox. Just please remember that you can't mess this up. You know, if if you do something you don't like, just stop doing it. Let it dry and, you know, go fix it later. All is not lost. It's looking much better. A little bit of both panes and diox some white. There we go. I like that a lot. Okay, we're going to start moving down a bit, keeping just a little diox on here. A little bit of white. Let's get some of that between the canvases there. Much better. Tiny points of this white. Don't pick up too much. We're just accentuating. We're not, you know, trying to build our layers of color. So you don't want a ton of paint. Let's get just a tiny bit more of that paints. A little bit more white. Right in there. Let's see, right here on that transition spot. Just do whatever colors you feel like are right for that area. You don't have to, you know, look at what I'm doing and try and put the exact same colors in the exact same place because, you know, we all do things a little bit differently and maybe, you know, the way that you've applied your colors, maybe some other color would be better right here in this spot, like where I'm working. So just pick up the colors that you feel like are right. There's not a right and wrong. You can't do this wrong. I'm gonna go into a little bit more diox and some white and start kind of building that highlight right in here. There we go. And then let's come into our quinacridone, a tiny point of quinacridone and some white. Now we've just pulled a little bit of that quinacridone up into there where it didn't exist before and that kind of helps, you know, accentuate that reflection look that we want. You know, the bottom cloud areas reflecting up onto higher areas. I'm gonna add just a little bit more of that. I like that. There we go. Don't forget about the deep violet. So I might just kind of get lost in this process for a minute. So if I don't talk, just know all I'm doing is picking up whatever color I want to see in that area and overall lightening my highlights because we don't want our trees to get lost in the sky.
I know I promised we weren't gonna spend as much time on this part as on the other part, but again, I just, I love this technique so much. Just little bits of scrubbing. We are gonna actually start moving into the quinacridone, so I'm gonna clean off my brush. Okay, my brush is clean and I dried it on a paper towel pretty good. Let's go into our quinacridone. Just load up a smear of it on there and we'll get some white. Maybe let's get the teensiest, tiniest amount of yellow there. Just really start to see some hints of that glow, that warm color in there. Maybe not that much. That's okay. If it gets away from you like that. It might not end up being so bad, and if it is, we'll cover it up later. I think that's actually okay. I might throw just a little hint of white in there. Not too bad. even want to put an itsy bitsy amount of it just kind of in an area like this again it's really just to warm that quinacridone up I'm not necessarily going for orange just yet just looking to warm it up in a couple of places away from me so I'm gonna take a, just a hint of diox because that's what's down here there we go just nudge that diox up underneath it and it pulls it back into the into the colors below and I'm probably gonna need to wash my brush again because I dipped back into the purples All right, clean brush back into my quinacridone. We'll get the tiniest speck of yellow, some white. If you are using different colors than I am, before you get started, just test them out. You know, if you're not certain how the colors work together, test them out before you start committing them to your canvas because I would hate for you to, you know, pick two colors that you think are gonna really work nicely together only to find out that they don't. So just make like a little, a little color swatch that where you kind of experiment with all the colors and the mixtures to see how they, how well they play together. I have a quick video on my Instagram, on my IGTV account, that shows kind of my process that I go through to choose colors. So hopefully that's helpful to somebody. Basically, I just kind of start with all of the colors that I think I might want to use, and I lay them out on my palette, and I see how they mix with all of the other colors see if I can get the, the colors that I want mixing those colors. And if not, then I, you know, don't use that one. I use something else, but it's a really helpful way to kind of plan out your color palette rather than 
you know, saying, well, I need a red for here and just grabbing the first red you, <laughs> the first red you see, slapping it on your canvas later and going, uh oh, that was absolutely not the right color of red. So I recommend that you try that. This is kind of a dark area. Let's kind of punch some color and life into it. This is starting to really look like what I was wanting. And we're almost done. We just have the canvas below this one. And I feel like that one will be quicker. Of course, I say that now and then it won't be. I can start adding just a little bit more yellow. Still keeping that quinacridone in there though. Tiny polka mat medium. Let's get this right in here. There we go. This area down here is already pretty light, so I don't need to focus on making it lighter, just getting colors where I want them. We'll get a few punches of that yellow, nice and bright. Well, let's see, I'm just gonna get a little matte medium and kind of use what's on my brush. So I'm almost just glazing that punchy yellow color over top of everything. it over that purple and kind of kick it back in there a little bit and if I feel like it starts to look muddy with the glaze over it, I can just take some white and kind of cover it a little bit more or all together if I like I'm gonna let a hint of it show through I feel like I'm pretty much done here I'm just kind of taking little bits of white Scattering them with some matte medium just here and there. bit of white over top of that kind of transition line there. Maybe I'll even throw a little bit of yellow. There we go. 
So I still have my blue. But I didn't want it to be just like a stripe across the bottom. Just to kind of show a hint of it is perfectly fine. Just let that taper off right there. Last part and then I'm done with the sky. Okay, there is our night sky and I'm gonna let it dry for a little bit and then we'll come back and do our trees and we'll be done. Okay, this is all dry and it's time to start adding our trees. So for that, I'm gonna use my number 10 round brush, but use whatever brush you have, whatever it is that you're comfortable with for making trees. If that's an angle brush, whatever it is. Now, the hard part about doing this painting is it's so large that I can't show you the entire thing unless I'm zoomed way out. So I'm going to kind of show you how I'm going to do the trunks while I'm zoomed out. And then when I start doing the branches, I'll zoom you in a little bit closer. So I wet my brush in the jar and it has a little extra water in it to get my paint to really move. And I'm going to get some black paint. I'm just going to do my trees in solid black. If you wanted to, you know, get really fancy and highlight them, you absolutely could. Sometimes I just really like the simplicity of a silhouette. Now I'm going to start at the bottom and go up. And one of the things that's going to help, well, there's two things that really will help these trees seem like you're down below and looking straight up through them. And one of them is that they're going to be quite wide at the bottom and quite narrow at the top. And more so than in a regular tree. You know, if I were just painting a normal tree here, it would be a very slow transition from wide to narrow. But in here, it's gonna be quite wide and it's quickly gonna get narrow. That's gonna make it have a lot of distance above you. One of the other things is that rather than having sprawling branches that open up like that, you're gonna make it seem like you're looking up at it by having the branches come in just a little bit tighter and point more upwards. Oh, one other thing that's gonna make it have some distance above you is having everything at an angle. So right here in the center, your trees can be pretty much straight up and down. As it comes to the side, they're gonna start angling a little bit toward the center. So anything like if a tree comes from over here, it's gonna angle up toward the center as well. A tree that starts here is still going to move that way. So everything kind of coming toward a central point. So let me show you what I mean. I'm going to start with one right about here. I'm just going to kind of get the shape of the tree in there right now. I'm not worrying about how wide it is. I'm just worrying about how I want my tree to move, how tall I want it to be. So see how it started in the corner here and it moved up to here. Now I'm gonna widen it out. So nice and narrow there. I know you can't see how narrow it is there. It's about, it's about that narrow up at the top. Very, very narrow. Very narrow and I'm gonna start putting more pressure on it. See how quickly that widened out more pressure and that's as wide as my brush will go so I'll have to come back and you know widen it out as I go. And like I said if you prefer like a angle brush or something to do this with go ahead. My round brush is quite soft, so that's why we're showing quite a bit of the texture there. That's okay, it just takes me a, an extra minute or so to get that part filled in. Nice and wide at the bottom here. Just getting a little extra water whenever I feel like I need it. Kind of 
fill that in a little bit, although it doesn't really matter because I'm just going to paint the edges black anyway. And I think I'm going to come back with my half inch and not worry about that. I'll just fill that in with my half inch later. For now, I'm just going to work on getting my trees on there. Let's do another one. Maybe this one starts right here, kind of comes up. See, I'm kind of letting my brush wobble a little bit. And maybe this one's not quite as tall. I'm just going to get the overall shape on there and then I'll fill it in with my with my half inch flat later. Nice and wide at the bottom there. Let's do a couple more of these really large trees. Then we can do a couple smaller ones. Maybe I've got one that comes from over here. And it can be quite a bit taller if I like. Kind of make it come up to there. And widen it out. Hope you can see that one. I can't back up any farther because my workstation is behind me. I think maybe one more. start working on the branches and maybe some smaller some smaller trees this one doesn't have to angle quite so much because it's coming from closer to the center kind of overlaps my moon there This looks like just a bunch of lines right now. I'm going to go to my half inch flat now so I can fill in those trunks. This were a newer 
half inch flat. I could have done the whole trees with it, but my flat is starting to get a little bit puffy because I tend to scrub. I like to scrub. <laughs> I scrub with this brush sometimes. So the, it's kind of starting to puff out just a little bit, just enough to where I wouldn't be able to get the small line up at the top. Now this part of the painting, the trees, I think the, the fewer trees you put in, the stranger it's going to look. If you can really dedicate some time to putting in a lot of trees with a lot of branches, I think you'll probably like it better. So like right now, it looks pretty strange. <laughs> I just have a few trunks, no branches. Just looks like weird black stripes. Okay, I'm gonna go to my number eight round brush, a little bit of black, some water, load that up and roll my brush so I can keep a bit of a point. I'm just gonna do my main branches with this and I'll come back with a long liner later. I'm gonna come in here and really just kind of take that some crazy way right in front of the moon. I'm not going to go too much more with this one. I'll save the little detail branches for the, the long liner. Let's come down into here and just kind of jag some branches out there. Let's get another one here. Maybe it starts on this lower canvas and comes up. Let it cross in front of you know, one of the other trees. Let's take this one. Maybe we'll take this one up the other way. want you to kind of lose yourself here. Just make a million, million branches. Enjoy every single one of them. Don't be afraid that you're getting too many branches. You can't have too many branches. So when I said that having your branches be a little bit closer in is one way to make it seem very distant. So that's kind of what I'm talking about. You know, it kind of, it does come out, but then it reaches up a lot more than it reaches out. Certainly it reaches out some. We've got a couple branches down in this area.
You can even take them up quite far here, even though that's all black, where it blocks out the stars. I think it'll make a subtle difference. You'll be able to see it a little bit and that will be really interesting. In fact, I'm going to let this one, I'm going to let this one go off the top of the canvas. And you may never even notice it there, but that's okay, because you may. From here on out, all I'm going to be using is black, so I'm not going to put my, my palette in your face anymore. Just picking up black paint. I'm, I, don't even think I'm going to use matte medium for anything from here on out. It's just black. So branches every single time we paint trees, somebody says, my branches are always too thick. What can, I, what can I do? What am I doing wrong? Please understand that it's all practice. You know, I haven't always been able to hold my brush like I'm holding it and be able to control the placement of my branches as well as the thickness and everything. That's something that comes from practice. And so it's something you have to work at. Let's see, I think I'm gonna bring, I'm gonna bring one out from here. Widen it a bit. The more you can bring some in from the edge, the more you can, you know, kind of build the, the idea that this is a, a, a vast forest, lots and lots of trees. I think I'm actually going to bring this one in a little bit farther. Let's get a few more over here. Nice wide branch there that tapers off. Oh, this one doesn't have very many branches. Let's give this one a few. So remember, if if your branches are too fat, if you feel like your branches are always too fat, there's one or two things that are contributing to that. The first one could be that you're using the wrong brush. Your brush is too puffy or old or 
you know, whatever. So I would first look at the brush you're using. You know, my, my round brush is still fairly new, so I still have a pretty nice shape on it. Sometimes I'll use an angle brush because with an angle brush, I feel like I can get a nice shape. But I wanted, I wanted to be able to control my shape a little bit more today, so that's why I used the round brush. Another factor that goes into it is pressure. If you're putting too much pressure on the brush, it doesn't matter how nice, how new, how shapely, how thin the brush is, it's going to give you big fat lines if you put too much pressure on it. So let me show you with this brush, I can get, you know, because I'm used to the amount of pressure it takes, even holding it clear back like that, I can get a nice, thin line. But let's say I go to my long liner brush, which I'm actually going to soon. If I'm holding it wrong, if you're holding your brush like this, you're more apt to kind of crank down on it, I think. And if you put your hand on your canvas, sometimes that can make you, you know, put too much pressure on it too. So even though this is a very thin brush, if I put a lot of pressure on it, look how fat my line is. It's much fatter than the line I got from this fat brush but holding it nice and loose and developing the muscle memory that it takes, you can get nice thin lines. But even if I have that muscle memory and I know how to get nice thin lines, if I'm using a brush that is puffy and old and doesn't have its shape, then I won't be able to get a nice thin line. So check both of those. If you decide that it's your hand, that you just are heavy handed, then it's something you need to work at. Always remind yourself when you start noticing that you're getting heavy handed, remind yourself to loosen up to, you know, it's all about how you hold your brush. Remember, I told you that if you hold your brush kind of like this, you're in danger of dropping it, right? And then that thumb is just there to kind of brace it. Holding it like that ensures that it's much harder to put heavy pressure on a brush because I have a very delicate light hold and I can come in here and I can get very delicate thin branches by holding it like that. But if I come in like this, even for me where I'm very practiced at that, that's really awkward and it's going to be really hard for me to get a nice branch that I like and that isn't too fat. So trust me, I know it feels awkward to hold your brush like this, but do it, try it, because I think you'll find that it makes it a lot easier to do delicate work than it does if you're holding your brush like that. Let's just keep on here. Still kind of going back and forth between just making branches off of these trees and coming back and putting in some new trees along the edges. Blend that in there. Whoa, so I guess that one's gonna be a wider tree than I had originally thought it was gonna be. There we go. This is a nice big tree, so it's gonna have a really wide branch here.
This is a painting that you could do, you could really do this on a single canvas if you like, just on, you know, a 12 by 16, just turn it the other way. Really, it would be the same, it would be the same thing, you would just, you know, have a little bit of a smaller view. This could be done on like five by sevens, that could be fun. Mm, that paint was a little thin, so that branch is kind of transparent. There we go. Okay, we're going to take a break from the number eight for now, and I'm going to go to my long liner. And we're going to start working on some detail branches up in here, as well as some shorter trees down in here and I may go back and forth between my long liner and my number eight down in this area. All right, so my long liner's loaded up with some black and I'm really just gonna kind of start and make little squiggly branches here and there. Get as crazy as you want. You know, do as many branches as you like. I think I'm just going to do some, but I'm not going to make you watch me do teeny tiny little branches for eight hours, so don't worry about that. I really like these branches that kind of cut in front of the moon. And it's good practice for your long liner if you're not real comfortable with the long liner then I encourage you to you know practice with it doing little branches like this is great practice for it be sure to keep a little extra drip of water on your long liner so that your your paint is nice and smooth if you start getting a lot of texture in there or it's skipping then your brush is just a little too dry you don't want it so wet that it's, you know, transparent and running everywhere, but you do want it to give you a solid line. Since we can mostly only see those little branches in here, I'm not going to do a lot throughout here. In these areas where it starts to get lighter, I'll do some more, but you be the judge on your canvas. You know, if you feel like you're gonna see those little branches in your darker area, then, you know, spend as much time as you want doing those little branches. If you feel like you're not really gonna see it, then don't worry about it. As we start moving down and get into the lighter areas, we will spend a little bit more time doing some smaller branches, so like right here. You'll be able to see that a lot better. So I'll put a few in there. Now, as we move into the areas where the branches are a little bit heavier, you really don't need to be terribly specific with your little branches because since all of these branches are kind of tangled up anyway, it's quite possible we're not even gonna see where it connects and it doesn't matter where it connects or not. I mean, you know, you can just kind of sketch on some random little stick bits for, for branches here and there. I think that 
if you can relax into using the long liner, you know, not, not tighten up and not freak out about it, not get too worried about what it's doing, just, you know, relax into it and let it do what it's gonna do. This can be a very zen technique, you know, doing these little branches. It's something you can absolutely get lost in. And for me, anyway, getting lost in little detail work like this is kind of what I have to do to be able to do it. Otherwise, you know, I get, I get bored, I get impatient, I start rushing through it, or I just give up on it halfway and I think, oh, that's plenty. I don't need more branches than that because I'm bored of doing them. So, you know, I have to kind of relax into them and, and just find that Zen place. Almost done, and then I'm gonna move down to the lower canvas. Make sure that that branch is connecting up here. There we go. I don't know if you can hear that, but it is just pouring rain outside. That's kind of nice. I like to paint when it's raining. That seems like a very inspiring time for me to paint. You know, if it's nice and sunny outside, then you might have other things you want to do, you know, go for a hike or, or whatever. But if it's rainy, you can't do a lot else. Might as well paint and let the, the moody atmosphere kind of inspire you. I don't think I'm going to do too many here either. Really, I just have some little ends. So some of them that look a little awkward from just kind of ending and putting some branches on and then, you know, maybe just a few here and there. See how wild and out of control my long liner gets? That's exactly what I like. I think the more you try to control the long liner and tell it, you know, what to do, until you're practiced at it anyway, but the more you try and do that, I think the more difficult it is to use. But if you know that it just kind of flips around in weird ways and you embrace that and let it happen, then I think that you end up happier with what it does. See, I'm just kind of almost bouncing my brush and letting my hand shake like that just encourages the brush to, to do whatever. And see, that's a wild line. I could very easily say, oh, I don't like that. It doesn't look like a nice branch, but Branches sometimes are just out of control and crazy, so of course it looks like a nice branch. It looks like a natural branch. All right, let's start adding in some smaller trees here. They're gonna follow the same rules as these larger trees. They'll just be shorter. And I'm gonna use my number five round and still just black paint. 
So we can kind of start down here and just get the shape of one in and come back and fill it in. Nice and narrow there at the top and gets wider. We don't want to make it quite as wide though because it's more distant. So that might be as wide as I make it there. just kind of disappears. Maybe we'll make it come out right there. Sorry, you probably didn't see the whole thing. It's the exact same. It's so hard to film this and make sure that I'm not going off of, you know, out of frame so that you can see everything. Go absolutely wild with these trees. Make so many trees. You can't have too many. Forests that are just jam-packed with trees are the best kinds. Uh, that might be okay, actually, for this size. Let's get a couple of branches in there. We'll come back with the long liner. few of these since these are a little more distant I'm not gonna put a whole ton of little detail branches in them because you know as things get to be more distant you start to lose some of the finer details so I don't think I'll spend as much time doing little detail branches on these ones just kind of cleaning up the ends and Doing a few. Let's add a few at the bottom with the long liner. So some, some just little distant ones. 
It's okay if the paint starts to kind of fuzz out. These are pretty distant. So that's all right. We can even make some that aren't necessarily trees, just kind of little scratchy bits kind of coming up. Maybe once in a while, one of them is a little bit taller. A lot of variation. Variation is what's going to make this really interesting. See how that tree is kind of, it's kind of hazy. That's okay. Just a few little bits over on the edges here to remind us that there's, you know, little trees moving in on the sides there. So you're just kind of making some random little stick slashes <laughs> just to put something in there. It doesn't all have to be full. You can have some negative space, but we don't want to make it look like we're just looking up through like five trees. <laughs> we, want, we want a good amount of trees here. It's a vast forest under a vast sky. And I think that you could do this painting for, you know, any kind of a feeling that you want. If you wanted it to be an autumn painting, you know, you just change the color of the sky, maybe put a little more detail into the trees, like, you know, some color in the trunks or whatever. Or you could have it be like a winter scene. You could do anything with this. I think I want to add one more tree. I kind of lost it on the branches on that one, so I want to cover that one a little bit. I'm going to go back to my number eight, and actually I have kind of a blank space here. I might throw one more in there, and then I feel like I'm about done. So my number eight round, a little extra water. And I'm going to make sure it goes through that branch there. So I'm going to start right here and make sure it cuts right through there. See? If you mess up and do a branch that you just hate, you can get rid of it. Take that one up into there. Long liner for some details.
All right, I am pretty happy with that, so I'm gonna sign it. And there is your Sunset Forest Triptych. I hope that this was enjoyable for you, and if you've never painted a triptych before, I hope that that helped answer some questions on how to accomplish that. If you have any questions about the process that I didn't cover, go ahead and leave me a comment below and I will do my best to answer that for you. Remember, if you're on Instagram, I would love to see how your painting turns out. So make sure that you find me there and tag me. A huge thank you to my awesome sponsor, Fredericks, who generously provided the three incredible canvases that I used in today's video. Like I've said before, in the past, when I've done this scrubbing technique, I've had to gesso a canvas before I could get the paint to really stick to it. But with my Fredericks canvases, I have no problem using my cloud brushes to do the scrubbing technique because it takes the paint beautifully. And as always, a huge thank you to all of you for painting with me every week. I appreciate it so much, and I'll see you next time.